I have two goals for my talk. One is to say what is green energy, and uh, and then secondly to talk about how do we get more of it. Um, what kind of things do we have to do? In terms of defining what green energy is. Uh, There's no such thing. And so there's my answer to you. And, and that's a very important answer. And that's why I wrote a book a few years ago uh, called Sustainable Fossil Fuels, which was not a book about fossil fuels. It was about how to get to a sustainable global energy system over the next century. And I put the name fossil fuels into the title to be a little bit ta daunting because I wanted to challenge the people who would like to look at the world as simply made up of good guys and bad guys. So there is you know, good forms of energy and we can support those, and there are bad forms of energy and we, that we're opposed to them. And unfortunately, the world's not so simple. Every one of our options has impacts and risks associated with it. And so what we're going to be engaged in is some kind of impact risk trade-off analysis. Option A versus option B, or option A versus all the other options. It isn't a world in which you can just fix on one of those options and talk about what warts it has and why you don't like it. So um, that's what I'm going to say about green energy. You cannot define it. Now, in, in a pure sense, of course there are attributes that will be more greener than others so that when we go to do that trade-off analysis, um, you know, that, that, that should be able to help us. And I'm going to get to that again at the latter part of my talk. A second point I want to make is that green energy is really also about using less energy. And so we need to use as little energy as possible. And the research that I've been involved in for 25 years now and 22 years as a professor has revealed to me that energy efficiency is way more difficult and even way more expensive than we think it is, or than what most people will tell you it is, and what I hear over and over again. Does that mean that I'm against energy efficiency? Quite the opposite. What it means is I'm thinking about how do you actually make it happen if it's not so easy as its advocates or, or others would like us to believe. That ends up turning me to policy kinds of questions about how you really aggressively pursue energy efficiency. It turns out that it isn't just about giving money to people and they'll buy a more efficient, uh, they'll insulate their home. Because what'll happen is, if you haven't also changed their energy prices, they'll expand the size of their home while they insulate it. Or if you get them an efficient car, they may use it more, or they may actually end up with an extra car. So there are a whole bunch of aspects to trying to make energy efficiency happen that it's important to really understand um, how it is difficult to, to, to really get our energy use down. We need to do that very aggressively. Um, and then finally, and this will be my theme right now, but it's a little bit unfair uh, because it isn't the only theme, but greenhouse gas emissions are pretty darn important. So zero or near zero emission sources, uh, renewables, first and foremost, I hope, uh, maybe even nuclear power, and maybe fossil fuels with carbon capture and storage in some jurisdictions, in some cases. Uh, those are things that we have to look at as, as possibly being green uh, you know, when we take into account all the other attributes as part of that impacts and risks. And so that is my main point about green energy. This latter point about fossil fuels and making a pitch for it, I think that's where I can cut parts of my speech short because I think in an audience like this, I don't need to focus on it. I've got, uh, so I'll quickly go through the next few overheads, this one, so don't even try to read the details on there. I'm not sure if you could anyway. It's simply something taken from uh, the Stern Report on the Economics of Climate Change for the United Kingdom government, where they talk about all the things that are impacted when we talk about climate change. So that's an important thing to think about, though, when you're saying, I have a valley and I want, you know, a, a valley with a small water system, a drainage basin, and I'm really worried about the rivers and streams in that system, and I, and I want to, to, to not have a great deal of harm happened to them. Absolutely. And remember, if we don't do anything about climate change, there will be a great deal of harm happening to those systems. Water flows will change, uh, temperatures, uh, uh, there will be a loss of biodiversity. This is what the scientists are telling us. I'm not a natural scientist, but those are the kinds of significant changes. Then I've got uh, an overhead to point out that uh, our, our temperature in British Columbia, the trend right now of the last 100 years, is a rising temperature. 
and also uh, a problem that we all know about, uh, the pine, pine beetle affected areas. I also, so I'm moving quickly through these ones and, and be able to focus on other things. Some people say, you know, that's great, you environmentalists who care a lot about the environment, but you don't care enough about equity. We've got to worry about equity. Um, your environmental policies are going to hurt low-income people or people in certain regions and so on. Those are legitimate concerns. And we need to be, policy needs to, 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 to deal with those as best it can. But believe me, the climate change issue, many people I know, many experts argue, is that it is the ultimate equity issue. So if you care about equity, you're going to care about that, about addressing that as well. And I've got two overheads from my friend uh, Kirk Smith, who's on the Global Energy Assessment with me. He's a professor at uh, California at Berkeley. And this is from a paper he and some colleagues did in 2007, in which they um, mapped the size of countries by their contribution to greenhouse gas emissions. And I'll show you that in the first slide. And then in the second slide, map the size of country by the probabilistic impacts that are already happening. So, so here's, some of you may have seen this by now, here's the planet mapped in terms of, uh, of total cumulative greenhouse gas emissions to the year 2002. And then here's that map, uh, and so you can see how skinny Africa is down there and how uh, large uh, North America is. And um, you know, Canada, we have a large land mass but a smaller population, so this is uh, cumulative emissions uh, is, is what counts here. Now here's the impacts. And, and the reason is because e even if you, uh, this is probabilistic analysis of uh, mortality risk, uh, that already now uh, with, with uh, rising temperatures, uh, warming, even in Africa, the uh, elevation level of where malaria is, is prevalent has risen, so there are more people at risk. There, that's just an example of the kinds of analysis that these people uh, do. These are some of the world's leading researchers. And so that, that is impacts already to date on a probabilistic basis from what the scientists are telling us, the changes that we're already causing. So I'm gonna leave that issue so that I can focus in on the second part of my talk, which is, how do we get more green energy? And I have a really simple answer. It's uh, emissions pricing. You have to have a price on emissions. And I'll be happy to make that argument, I'll make that argument a little bit now, but I'll be happy to make it in question period as well. So, and so if, if emissions relates to, uh, so we're gonna focus on emissions for now. Um, Policies can directly price emissions, so like the carbon tax we have in British Columbia, but you can equally put in a cap and trade uh, on emissions. And people will argue about which one's better. The United States is just starting to heat up in that argument. We had the argument for quite a while in Canada. I, I've always been trying to argue to people, I don't care. We have to get a price on emissions. So. Uh, when someone is saying it's got to be the carbon tax, I'll say fine, but you know it could be cap and trade. There are pros and cons to each one. Or when someone's saying it's got to be cap and trade, and I'll say well yeah, but it, it could be carbon tax. So I've seen in the media uh, where different uh, writers, uh, journalists, different people have identified me as sort of the father of the carbon tax or the father of cap and trade. I don't care, but you have to price emissions. We make millions of decisions every day in a market economy, and government can't control those decisions. The only way those decisions are influenced in a certain way is if the price related to the emissions from that decision is slowly, gradually, maybe even quickly, going up over time and perceived to, and it will change the choices we make. Um, and there really isn't another way to do that. I will say that you can do it with regulations. And in fact, I would even argue sometimes that certain kinds of regulations are almost like emissions pricing. Um, and the example that I'll give 